It's a Dungeons and Dragons podcast that'll really make you think. We're spicing up the rules, mashing up the homebrews, and stirring up the debates. Add a little touch of our own, and you have Chef Bogue and the Pirate Captain's Recipes for Everything. With your host, the Pirate Captain. It's not because I took on an entire ship by myself and walked away unscathed just off good looks alone. Chef Bog. I have in my rules for the original AG. Don't be a dick. And Lok the Bard. Lock the Bard bans all bards from his campaign. That wouldn't go over very yeah. well. And without further ado, here are your hosts. Well, that's right. We're back at it again for another fun-filled episode with me, the titular pirate captain. There you go with the titch again. I know. Well, I was waiting for somebody to come in and respond, but we'll leave that be. We'll come back to that one in a moment. As you just heard, it's me bestest buddy, Bogue. How hey, you doing, hey, Bogue? I'm, I'm here. And the ever so wonderful, and he's a damn bard, of course, Loke. Loke Everybody the Everybody loves the bard. Everybody but me. Literally and figuratively. Our, this is Chef Bolg and the Pirate Captain's Recipes for Everything. I am, like I said, the Pirate Captain with me and my bestest buddies. we got a couple more guests with us on this episode. Uh, this is the most people we've ever had in a room on a single episode. I'm excited about this, but before we get to them, I just want to shout out, hey, if you're listening to this, you're going to find us on Amazon. Amazon allowed us to put our podcast on their platform. So if you have Amazon Music, we're there now. Also, we've got the YouTube up and going. So now you'll be able to go in and listen. So I know a lot of people don't watch YouTube. They listen to YouTube. Well, our episodes are there. So if you have a friend who can't get podcast, give us a like, a subscribe, a thumbs up, and you can comment and talk to us there. We also have a website coming. It's in the works. We're still kind of building it as we speak. we got a, a few more things to flesh out, so be on the lookout for the Chef Bolg and Pirate Captain website. But we also want to remind you about our Facebook, Chef Bolg and Pirate Captains, the email, bolgnpc at gmail.com, and then you can always find some of our best work by our bestest buddy, Bolg, on the, or you can find our recipes on the DMs Guild. So always be on the lookout for more content from us, uh, and you'll be good. Uh, we have a returning voice with us. Uh, Hi! Yeah, actually, I had a couple of emails from people. I was impressed. Nobody ever emailed us before, even with some of our better, our bigger name people, but people actually emailed us because of her. They just wanted to hear her say tits one more time. Tits! Yeah, that's you're, great. You're the, you're the titty captain, right? The titular captain. Oh, titty. Titular. Tits. Titular. Tits. Titular. 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 <laughs> All right. Uh, so we have Drava back. She was actually a fan favorite from the last episode. People like that, so I'm excited to have you back again. Uh, and then we actually have my IRL bestest buddy. Uh, we play video games together. This actually, I do want to actually get into the story of how we became bestest buddy because it is of this game, this group that we uh, we are the bestest of friends. I'm the only guy that he's like, hey man, my house is overflowing with poop, and I show up with a mop and water boots. That's a lie. I didn't have boots on. I was barefoot. It was very fun. It was really weird. Yeah, it was a bad day. Yeah. This is my buddy Felix the Gnome Wizard. Hi, my name is Felix Fizzleburn. Oh, man. Hi. This isn't Hi, the gnome Felix. that I threw, though. Oh, God, he's so short. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is uh, our buddy Felix. He's in here to have a couple conversations. He wanted to laugh at me. He's like, He laughed at me for the last month about feet. And not because it was feet on your bo- on that go on the end of your ankles, but the uh, feet that I and me and my dark vision. Because being able to see through magical dark vision doesn't make broken. sense. It's fucking broken. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Felix, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I really don't have much to say about myself. <laughs> not much at all. He's a man of little words. Little, and, uh, little, ma- little man, little words. <laughs> not much to say. Oh. What makes Felix your, your favorite character that you decided to do with that persona? Because so, we already had an orc. So Felix was a uh, was a one shot character that I made for a uh, game of a buddy of mine, and it was the first game my wife ever played in. So when my wife actually came in, she'd never role played. She'd never seen me role play. She'd never done any of that. And so uh, I wanted to create a character that was fun. That was entertaining, and really, my <laughs> wife likes to be well. Doesn't like to be broken, but she gets broken uh, <laughs> whenever she laughs. Her. She'll laugh so hard you can break her, and it's a goal of mine to break her once a day. Uh, so the moment I started uh, <laughs> talking as Felix Fizzleburn, uh, which had a charisma of four on a gnome, 
Um, it just turned into a, uh, a fan favorite of mine. I've tried to use it a couple other times, but realistically, just watching my wife laugh about it was the best. I love making your wife just like fall over with laughing. And the easiest way for me to do it, just say some of the most darkest things I can think of. And she's like, y- your wife who pretends to be so innocent and pure of white satin, she's got a dark black spot on the back of that dress that just says, no, I'm evil to the core. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. until, until you break her and she turns bright red. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, welcome to the welcome to the show, Felix. Bog, you've got some hors d'oeuvres for us, buddy. What you got for us in the latest hey, of D&D got, news? Got my little plate of hors d'oeuvres. So uh, first up, uh, Dragonlance is coming back, which uh, old heads might remember Dragonlance uh, was a big part of the setting and the novels and stuff like that. The War of the Lance was where they, uh, what that whole thing was called, and they're actually bringing it back as that time period. We're going to be playing again in that time period with a uh, module um, the adventure book Dragonlance Shadow of the Dragon Queen is on its way in 2022, so it's this year. And there's going to be a cooperative board game called Dragonlance Warriors of Kryn. They're both going to be set in that uh, War of Lance. They're going to be somewhat tangential to each other. Um, I think it's really cool. I think it's going to be awesome for uh, a lot of us older players who have been around to go back to that setting and enjoy that type of thing again. Um, but also I was on Amazon and saw that Marvel has released an updated version of their old, uh, role-playing system called, uh, the multiverse role-playing game. And, uh, it's a play test book right now. I think it's 10 bucks on Amazon and, uh, it, it's like the old system, but they've got an awesome new thing called the, uh, the 616 D616 rolling system where you have two dice and then one special die. If you get a 616, it's a huge thing. I just thought that was really cool. Um, something new and exciting. Because while we all love to play D&D, it's nice to throw something else in there every once in a while. We've talked about in the past how it would be really cool to have like an Avatar D&D or something which else. Also in there. And, we, and we've actually played the we played the original version of the Marble one, which was there's a lot of systems in it. So I hope that this one's actually going to be a little bit more streamlined to make, make it a tad bit easier because that one was all over the place. So what, what I, from what I've read, they have streamlined it a bit, but also given more options, which was something the first one was lacking. So yeah, you really didn't have much. You either had to have a superpower or you were a civilian, <laughs> and I didn't really feel like being a damsel in distress. Yeah, so so most of my favorite superheroes don't have powers. You also don't look good in a dress. Uh, yeah. I beg to differ. We you have looked amazing. In thank that you. Dress. And I'm going to tell you, it breathed. Everybody else was <laughs> suffering, and I'm sitting out there. I was like, it really flows up under here. <laughs> yeah, the one time I wore pants, and I was miserable. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm telling you, we, and it sucks that we didn't get to do anything this year because what 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 Drava is referencing to is a, this group of friends right here. We go out and we do things that we go to Renaissance fairs, movies, go karting, all sorts of things together as a big group. And when we go to the Renaissance fair, it's always somebody's job to pick the theme. And the theme that I picked the year before, I was like, we're going to be pirates, of course, me, the pirate captain picking pirates. And they said, you won't dress up like a female pirate. And I was like, watch me. Yeah, instead of the pirate captain, he was the pirate wench. Uh, I was the pirate captain Ness, all right? Let's be honest, all right? You're a wench. uh, (laughs) (laughs) At least I had amazing titulars. (laughs) You showed so much cleavage. (laughs) So much titulars. There was nothing there. (laughs) the The best part was, was like, there was uh, one of my favorite stories that came out of this was when me and, um, oh, she, one of our previous guests uh, was with us. We went over to a to an archery thing. We were just hanging out. And this guy was being chatted up by this, like, sexy fairy who was just striking out, which she was pretty good looking, and this dude just was not having her. And he go, as I walk up and he goes, he gives me the old cat whistle, and I was like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So that's right. I'm turning heads all around. <laughs> Pirate Captain S. Ah, so I got it. Yeah, we we missed out. We were going to be fairies or fae creatures this last time, and all the the stuff that was going to happen. I, you were supposed to make me wings. <laughs> I was going to go make like a uh, a whole like loincloth made of leaves and everything, poison ivy, just to make it really good. But I want it to be believable. Um, so yeah, we well, this is the kind of the fun things we do. So always be on the lookout for us. If you see somebody that looks like a pirate captain but is acting like a pirate wench, it's probably me. <laughs> With my amazing titulars. Mm. So those were our door our hors d'oeuvres, by the way, giving you the latest on D&D news. But now it's time to get into the topics at hand. Today's episode is going to have a lot of different things. Uh, reskinning a module for easier time. Scaling combat for your players. Are your monsters too mean? Fun ways to roll stats. And then my question I'm looking forward to is, can you really, polymor- can you really polymorph a druid? 
So uh, we're going to save that one for later. I want to get into that. But something we were talking about, and you were w- wanted to mention it when you were here last time, Drabo, was uh, reskinning a module for an easier time. Because you have say you were talking about modules and how sometimes they can be a little bit either outdated or just a, a little bit tougher. But if you can take it and make it modernized, let's say you want to make it a modern campaign where you have like Boy Scouts and doing things, it actually made it an easier time for you to be a DM. Yeah, because we were talking about how my thing was that we were all Boy Scouts and... That's not really something you find very often when you're looking at the modules for D&D. But I was going through and I was like, okay, well, I want, you know, actual real life mythology stories. And sometimes you can find those creatures as far as monsters. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes the and the, the environments weren't necessarily right. So I would reskin stuff. And, yeah, we were really talking about whether it's easier to reskin or to homebrew. And I found that when you do some of the homebrews, sometimes if you can't play test it, it turns out overpowered. And I liked to do the reskinning version. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of reskins. Um, you know, if, if if you got a werewolf, everybody's seen a hundred werewolves. Party knows how to beat that werewolf. Uh, you know, but now a lupine <laughs> is a brand new monster. Slightly different. It's Slightly French. different. It's, it, it's allergic to, uh, <laughs> it, instead of being allergic to silver, it's allergic to copper. Uh, oh, 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 actually, I like Zimur and Baguette. Uh, yeah. and, and it's a <laughs> actually, my, my, monster. My new Lupine's nice. actually more, he's actually gluten-free. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so you've, you've reskinned the monster, so it, it, give, it's, it, it gives it a different flavor. Yeah, you change the flavor text. With, That's all you're doing. Without do, the, the risk of imbalance, like if you create a completely new creature... Uh, you don't know if how if CR wise is going to rate with the players you're playing with. Changing just a little little bit of the flavor just to make it a little bit more complicated, a little make it more spicy, a little fresh. You you could even take that creature and you can um, use the same block stat and just give it a different name. Uh, I've done that many times uh, whenever I've dated my games to where I just take like like if, like my big bad guy at the end was a diva. Um, not you know, hey, but you know, diva. Uh, and uh, so why can't I, I be a CR twelve? I'm delicious. <laughs> so uh, we ended up. Uh, I ended up using that, but I reskinned it a bit to where you know it did necrotic damage as opposed to radiant. In some cases, I doubled the hit points to make it the big bad guy. You know, there were certain things I reskinned to make it easier, uh, uh, or well, fit the role, not easier. But I, the I feel a little back into a corner here because. You know my stance. No, I'm a build it. Guy. Yeah. I'm a build it. Why do you got to build it from the top up when it's already pre-built for you? There, there's, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with going to Walmart or IKEA and finding all the thousands of pieces and trying to put it together, throwing it in the garbage. You going screw it? I'm just going to use a milk crate uh, because that's just the way I prefer to do things. Uh, I mean, reskinning has its uses, but for me, if there's say I, I um, want a blood-based creature, I could reskin an ooze, sure. But no, I want to make something new. So that's what I went out and did. I have blood-based creatures that I have made and that are based... I take that ooze, like, CR, kind of, and and its, um, I, its I, basic attributes and then mix them up and create something entirely new out of it. I, I just want to argue with you, though, but how, how are you really creating something new that's already probably been created out there? Like, you're all, you're just giving a buff to something. You're going out there and going, oh, um, here's, like, plus two to your con. Like, just as an example, I almost said stamina, like, oh, you're getting power word fortitude, and he'll get that. Um, but that's the idea. Like, you, you, there's nothing wrong, like, reskinning and why versus rebuilding. It's a lot quicker to reskin something to make he, it easier. Yeah, yeah, Even the new Batman right. didn't build his Batmobile. He reskinned the Dodge Charger. <laughs> there is no new idea. There is just reskinning of old ones. I, I, and I understand that. And I, for you guys, that I'm works just out glad just that fine people for are on me. my side I for like once. To, <laughs> I like to homebrew. Yes. That's just the way I like to do it. It's fine to reskin. Like I said, there are times when reskinning is much easier, much quicker. Uh, if you want to reskin a Velociraptor to a um, Ultra Raptor, you make it a large, give it a little bit more, you know, damage. But you want to take a Velociraptor and make it into a horse. You know, you got to do a little bit more work than just reskinning it. So I I think I have the same issue with that is because uh, as I DM games and when I do DM games, I have ADHD, which makes it really hard for me to sit down and want to create things. 
when I do my sessions, it's all in like like within 10 minutes of me thinking of the idea. I have to hyper focus on something. So I'm taking a creature, I'm redoing it. I am interested in that creature. I use it and I move on. So it's more personally as a personality trait and medical thing for me just to be able to hyper focus on it and reskin it as opposed to you who can dedicate yourself and spend hours or at least even a couple, you know, 10, 20 minutes per creature to make them. Um, it's just more, I guess, of the investment that you put into it. See, and when I'm reskinning, I'm not even increasing the power or changing the size. I am literally changing the flavor. You know, it, instead of the troll skin being green, that troll now has gray skin. Yeah, instead, instead, of, instead of being fire really and cooking, acid. You're really cooking with salt and pepper yeah. over there, buddy. Or instead, yeah, instead of, of like fire a, and acid being its weakness, it's now radiant and necrotic. Yeah, instead of like, a, it, oh, this is a claw attack. No, this is actually a horn attack or just like simple things like yeah. that. But it's the but same it, mechanics. The sa same damage, same single weakness type so that it, it, it makes it stays the same CR, the same toughness. So when you're planning your, your uh, encounter... The encounter will still go as the same as if it was the original creature. Now, I will, I will say that sometimes I'll go into and I'll look at homebrew that someone else created to see if it will fit what I'm looking for. Because maybe because like I'm 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 planning a campaign for the P Philippines and there are already homebrews of Manon and Gauls and Aswangs and stuff like that that I would need as far as a monster. God and I can, you. yeah, <laughs> but I can look at them and see, okay, will this fit? Do I think this is going to be fine? Because sometimes the reskin doesn't quite work, but in general, I, re I prefer the reskinning. Uh, I mean, and I, I get it. I get it. It's it is faster, much faster mm. than home brewing. The the most recent recipe I made for the the three of us, uh, Loke, Pirate Captain, and myself, took a while. It took a long while because I was building us as level twenty characters. So I had to have all of that information. I had to contact you guys to get your uh, special stuff that I needed, and it took uh, each one took two three hours to get through. I understand that's a lot of commitment and work, whereas you could just go, okay, well, Chef Bolg's uh, an orc barbarian. I can just go and take the bandit captain and make him a little stronger. There, there you go. There's Chef Bolg. I, I understand it. It's just me personally, if I want to make an Oni, I'm not going to look at the hill giant and just reskin it. I'm going to look at the hill giant, look at the unicorn, look at... Uh, the demons, and then try and find some way of mixing them all up in my cauldron to, you know, create something entirely new. Yeah. I, I just, yet again, I, I want to go, it's really nice to have people on my side for once. <laughs> but no, like, there's not, like, Bart's okay, best I, I, game. I get go. it, but you, you've you built up. Uh, but don't yeah. give them dark vision. <laughs> ah. God forbid they can see through magical dark vision. <laughs> I hate you all. <laughs> But here's the thing, though. I mean, you're right. All an Oni really is is a troll, which is a different form. Like, it's different cultures. Like, dragons change through every culture. You're not really rebuilding a dragon or making your own unique dragon. You, it, When you can just make this dragon and go, okay, now you can also breathe a little bit of metal, you know, because now he's a metal dragon or something. I, yeah. Like, well, and, and, and but, but also, like, um, speaking specifically of trolls, when we were in Iceland for my campaign, the troll didn't fit the lore of what I needed. Are these like private different. private school kids that are in your campaign? These kids are like traveling to yes. the Philippines. Yes, basically. Like, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. They, they're very wealthy. Like one very of them, wealthy. one of them's a pop star. <laughs> one of them, yeah, uh, yeah. They're, they're well, wealthy parent kids. Yes. Yes. Damn. Yeah. Oh yeah. We we kill it on the fundraisers. <laughs> I can tell. There's more than just you know the the average bake sale. But, but so the D and D troll didn't fit into Icelandic trolls. So I picked a completely different creature. It, but it was a troll. I can't remember exactly what that creature was at this moment. But it was a completely different creature that fit the the storyline of what I was going with versus using the what the D and D would call a troll. Yeah, Bo Bog, you know, makes fun of me for. For you know, missing Thacko, but there's a lot of math if you're building from scratch because you need to make sure that the hit points, the damage dealt, the uh, special abilities, the uh, legendary actions, the layer actions all equate out to something that is going to be within the intended encounter range. It's things that have uh, already been that, play tested, right? Where if you're reskinning, it's already play test. You already know you're going to be in that range. I will say that, as but if you're building from scratch, there's a good risk that you could have just made a party killer 
that, on accident. That is the or most the, difficult the part yeah. of homebrewing is making sure the balance is right. But that's why I use those other stat blocks as a kind of guide. Um, without, I don't pull stuff directly from them. I kind of go for, I want this CR. Like, I want it for this specific type. What kind of creature uh, has the most to offer for that CR so I could try and build something from that? I, I, I get that that's the most difficult. There is a lot of math involved. It does take a lot of time. And I do usually, you know, pop onto Roll20, say, hey, I have a quick one shot. Can somebody help me with this? And play test that kind of stuff. Um, the blood ones I mentioned earlier, I had set their CR too low and they were decimating my, my play testers. So I had to up the CR and then trying it again. They were fine. It does happen with, uh, with, uh, with homebrew like that, which is, I mean, I'm not against reskinning. It's just not for me. See, I've made a, a few homebrew characters just because I wanted to mess with my party. For example, um, I looked online and I found a homebrew character at, or a homebrew, homebrew monster, but it was a very, um, I looked online, I grabbed it, and it was a Uzbek. So it, that's the name that they used for it. But instead of it having a high C or a high AC, it had a low AC. You had to get a low hit on it to be able to cause the damage. I bring that up because you can always use the same idea that somebody else has. You can always take their ideas off the internet and um, reskin them to your own needs. And uh, when I did that particular uh, monster, I actually made some changes on the fly because I've never used, you know, I didn't use a whole lot of homebrew. So I ended up taking that creature and as it did the damage, it, I realized on the first hit it did too much damage. So then the next time I hit somebody, I took away some damage from it and I said, oh, that first one was really, really big. So as a DM, they can't see behind the screen. So you can play test as you go and they'll have no clue that you're making changes as Absolutely. it goes. Yeah. And that's the wonderful part of, uh, of being a DM, is that you can make any change that you need to on the fly with your homebrew. Oh, yeah. You can, you can, um, a lot of DMs use you know, high CR creatures as, as a measuring stick uh, for what the, p the party can take. They'll, you know, you got a l five level 18s. Can they take out a CR uh, 24? Well, let's throw one at them. Let's see if it'll happen. And then if they're, ha if they're struggling, you can always go, ha ha, I'll fight you another day and run off. Oh, that's a yeah. cheese. That's a cheese thing yeah, to do. It's, murder. It's just like the app I use them every all. time. It tells me every single time that this encounter is too high for the party you're putting it against. Every <laughs> every notice how he says every time. Every single every time. time. Except because, for once. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Because the way that it calculates, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't take into account magic items. It doesn't take into account uh, whether you use optional rules such as feats and player creativity and player is a creativity big yeah. part of it. So it, you have to know where your player's threshold is, and, and that's one of the weaknesses of the CR quest thing. That that's another. Now go ahead, let's get into it because that's something that we were talking about: yeah. scaling yeah. combat for players. Are your monsters too mean? Well, I mean, yours, yes, but no, you no, know. no. My and it, it's more that they're too not. They're not mean enough a lot of times. Um, I'm glad I'm not playing tonight. Yeah, you usually make up for it with just having lots and lots and lots of yes. monsters. Because that's the I'm the, just going to beat you with numbers. The way it calculates out. Well, the way it calculates out. Uh, you know, if you're, you're fighting at level one, a CR one is a, a party of four is supposed to be matched up with a CR one. Typically, four players will wipe the floor with any single CR one creature. 99 out of 100 times because the players are it doesn't take into account like if you have a variant human in one of those four who's got a feat like great weapon master who's dishing extra damage but not dark vision but not dark vision yeah <laughs> dark too, dark vision yeah well yeah cr one's not <laughs> going to cast darkness but it's a second level spell <laughs> but uh <laughs> but uh yeah so i mean you've got to take that into account when you're doing the the cr math um, it's based on a with no optional, no optional rules, which means no feats. It means not using advantage for flanking. Uh, it, it is it is a special case that most people don't play as. So when you're calculating, you have to, uh, you know, fudge the numbers a little bit up to add in those extra. How much does a feat add to the CR rating? There's been many times that I've actually taken uh, where, where that same thing has happened with me where I will, uh, halfway through the fight, I'll realize, you guys are killing this thing way too quick. Like, this was supposed to be, like, the big bad guy of the day. 
and uh, where I would up the numbers against it. And that there has been times that I've taken away HP as well. I think you can scale a lot on a monster by literally just changing their hit points because the more actions that it gets, the more times that you hit it and it hits you back, then at that point, it's definitely going to make a huge difference as far as uh, you, scaling. Well, I think, I, I actually, I, instead of scaling HP, I think you actually need to scale back maybe the actions it can take. Because most monsters actually have more actions that they can take in a turn than actually players can. Oh, I'm Dep- absolutely the other the way around. It depends on how many party members uh, you have, Then too. a player, like, not I, players, yeah. player. Yeah. So you I, can actually be overwhelmed by even a single enemy because they have the layer action, the legendary right. action, the breath attacks that recharge. You can be overwhelmed by a single a single dragon very easily. So taking back from the actions that they can take, <coughs> I think, is one of those deals that it's better than trying to just scale it to yeah. HP. I, but I'm, when you have eight players who have are at a high enough level where they're getting multiple attacks per turn, a bonus action and a reaction. A, a lot of times, you, I bring in minion type care, even though they don't have minion rules in Five E. I use old school minion rules to bring in extra extra. Ac- they're for the action economy is basically why they are and, there. And that's uh, to, yeah, that's to eat up either the player's actions for them to take them out or to give extra attacks to the bad guys, because you know three layer three uh, legendary actions and a mu- two multi attacks. That's only five attacks compared to 16 in a typical party of eight. Yeah, but they don't have spell slots or things like that. They can free cast. Uh, no, they, they have spell slots. They a lot of them do. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of them that don't. That They can just free cast fireball and stuff like that uh, multiple times. Well, it, oh, most well, of I mean, that I comes typically with a recharge count. roll. Yeah. I mean, but the recharge roll is usually not that hard. Like, think yeah. about it. Breath attacks on D6. a dragon. How often do you get yeah. your breath attack back as a dragon? It's, it's a 16% Point? chance. One yeah. out of six. Yep. So. Or t- uh, sometimes it's two out of six. Yeah, yeah. depends sometimes. on the age. That's age what I'm saying. Of the dragon. Yeah. Yep. But, um, so that they say it makes it one out of three rounds. That mm-hmm. dragon has to survive for three rounds <laughs> to get that breath weapon back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but this I, I, I'm saying if the monster's too mean, like yeah. I said, scaling back its HP really like versus scaling back its action. So if you're actually if you're killing, uh, and I wouldn't say killing players, which you should, you should honestly as a DM, you should be willing to kill your players. Uh, Talking about that, um, if you don't mind, Um, I believe that it also depends on the DM itself. Uh, I've been with other DMs uh, where they will take the monsters and spread them across the board. Um, You know, two over here, two over here, two over here. Um, And where those DMs, uh, there's not really a huge threat of this one character dying. Um, Even if they do down that character, that monster moves on to go fight something else. It's not literally there stabbing somebody else. In the big bad fight of my last campaign that just ended last week or the week before, um, it the the big bad literally wanted to kill one of the characters because it was a son. So he was there on his extra turns stabbing him or his sister uh, mm-hmm. at the end of the round to intend to kill. And I think that as a DM, your monsters do need to be mean. Uh, they mm-hmm. need to be mean, but they also have to do what that normal monster would do. It's got to you you got to have consequences for the actions wh- whether it's good or bad. And I, I say this a lot because it, it's true because now your players need to have fear. And I cuz fear is good. Fear is going to encourage you to do to overcome challenges and great obstacles. So if you've got a, car- a creature that doesn't want to kill something just because it's down, doesn't it's not going to help it. You're you you need to have mean characters that do mean things. It's, it's a, yeah, but also if it's an animal intelligence level character, it's it, more likely going to kill you. It, Think well, about it. it. It'll, yeah, it'll it's, hit. It's there. You've got three other people hitting it. The guy that's knocked out unconscious is it going to take it waste one of its a- attacks to finish that one guy or pit is it going to go after when the other? When a pit bull locks, it's yeah. it's locked on for good and it's very likely going to let go unless you choke it out. Yeah. And it's just the animal I can think of right now. That does something like that. It's not. It's not. Once you, you're locked in and it's locked its jaws, you damn near have to choke the dog out. It's got to uh, let go un- unquenchingly. So if you have a dog, let's say a wolf, react, for instance, and you're level one and you're facing a pack of dire wolves and it's got a player on the ground, it's going to start trying to drag itself, uh, drag that thing off to go eat. Well, even if it's getting attacked, it's probably got its jaws. It's not going to let go of its source of food. Now, granted, this is also in the setting. If it's a starved wolf, yeah, it's probably going to be holding on for dear life. If it's a, a, a healthy wolf, it's somebody's fa- uh, fae controlled creature, probably not. And I can understand that argument. But you got these characters. Sometimes your monsters, and, and I say monsters, but I also just mean your NPCs have to be mean. Well, it, it has to make sense to what you're trying to say as far as a story. So if it would if it would be a creature or an NPC that doesn't want to kill, 
or even like in play, player characters who don't want to kill. They oh, can, we don't talk they can, about player characters that well, don't want to kill. They can they can <laughs> knock stuff out and move on because they don't want to. And so that it doesn't necessarily have to be because there are creatures that Except will kill and then move on. The stairs, <laughs> yeah. the stairs, they get you every time. <laughs> but it, it, it has to make sense. You can't just make a mean to be mean. It has to make sense to what you're doing because I'm like I said, I'm very story based. I'm very role play based. And you also have to be very careful that you're not targeting a single player. Like that, it, it, and it, the, it, these are all valid points. Yeah, it, in the example where you know the campaign that just ended. There was a story reason they were going at it. That they weren't picking on that. But if in every single fight you are going after the spellcaster first because it strategically makes sense to g- to take out the caster first. A high, if if my enemies are high intelligence, you're taking yeah. on uh, an elite level of mage killers. But that's what I'm saying. You're, Why do I care about the barbarian when my whole yeah. goal in life? Because you know, I, I, but and I'm that's an argument like, to her point. Yeah, I'm talking Just like this part. Your you're, you're fighting animals this week. You're fighting assassins the next week. You're fighting barbarians the next week, but you're always targeting the caster because as a DM, you know They're that the is trouble. strategically the, the best move to make. You start It starts to feel you, like you're picking on that character. You, well, sh- you should always be in the mindset of the monster yeah. as the DM as opposed to the mindset of the strategist DM. Yeah, well, Lo- uh, Loke has a, a way of doing it that I really like. He will... If it doesn't really matter, if he's sur- if if a, a monster or or the the enemy is being surrounded, if it doesn't matter who, like nobody has hit the monster, there's no reason for him to pick something specifically. Then he'll he'll roll. He'll go, okay, you're one, you're two, you're three, you're four, and he'll roll roll a d4 to find out what the enemy is going to hit against. But if it's like, okay, this character just struck him, he's going to go after that character. He'll pick. Based off of what yeah. makes sense for what the enemy were fighting, and, and they'll also do it off a of dis. Like if you guys are all spread out, and this one is within range, close, it's going to go after the close one. He's not going to go after the one in the back. You know, I, I mean, they, they do it in ways that make sense. Uh, um, Felix, Loke, and Pirate Captain, you guys have been in my games. Yep. Um, one of the ways that I take a what you would normally assume would be an a, a uh, easier fight and make it more difficult is by doing the exact opposite of what uh, you had said. I actually give them more action action economy. I'll give them a second initiative. Like if you're going after your level five, you know, uh, adventurers, and you cause a ruckus in town, and the guard uh, the guards come with their guard captain, and their guard captain's this. You don't mess with this guard captain. He's gonna have two initiatives. He's g- uh, he's only what a, a CR two, right? But again, more well, more that, that actions is the is the the point of it. Is it yeah. It's a great yeah. counter to having yeah. more players. Yeah. yeah, right. And and that's I mean, yeah. essentially you're having two. My guard, guard, guard captain would never be the CR. That that guard ca- CR's two guard captain in the monster manual is the typical guard I reskin. Yeah, the, the, see, they're, <laughs> yeah, they, guard they, captains are weak in the yeah. in the DM's and manual. And the the one eighth CR regular guard that's ain't gonna guard squad. Yeah, yeah, that's a civilian for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well. Also, in in uh, most campaign settings, the the uh, adventurers once they get past level three are now you know city destroyers. Yeah, they uh, can. I don't know. Uh, I, at level three, I don't think you're a city destroyer. Maybe you're probably, a town destroyer. Yeah, I say you're you're maybe a, 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 a what's a, what's smaller than a town? A hamlet. A hamlet. That's the word I was exactly looking for. This is why he's my best friend. Uh, mm-hmm. ha- a hamlet destroyer. You, you know. know things. <laughs> Yeah, but lo- uh, by uh, by fi- fifth level you can take on towns. By eighth level, you, uh, cities will have troubles with you. By you know tenth level, you're you're in the hero legends. Yeah, you, you know your your campaigns by above the by the tiers of play by that third tier of play, you're affecting nations. Yeah, yeah. By uh, your act, your very actions change the courses of countries. Right, and so you, the, uh, the, this is where in the CR system is definitely a bad has a bad scale problem with it. Like yeah. it's really hard to gauge it because you you got players and stuff like that. And there are actually charts out there that'll tell you, hey, if you've got four level fives, you should probably be using this CR or something like that. So but then CR to me has always been close recommendation. Yep, it's <laughs> never it's never <laughs> been any other thing other than close recommendation in my mind. But I think you know sometimes if if they're if they're blowing through your encounters, mm-hmm. like they come in and they're like snap their fingers and everything's dead, all right, you've got a power scaling problem. It's just like an anime. 
All right, you get these training arcs, they come back and they blow through everything in the next arc for a little while until they get to the arc after, and you're like, all right, well, this was boring. There was real no consequences. So making your characters a little bit meaner, a little bit tougher, whether it's adding extra actions, taking, uh, adding HP, sometimes makes those players... I, I, I have a feeling that your players would actually enjoy that. Yeah. I, I have more of a problem with I will be killing them People way die. too quickly. People will be dying... And I'll, I'll, I'll half the HP that's left so that somebody might survive the encounter. I wish I could get that that episode or that, t- that I think it's that movie of D- uh, on that D&D movie on Amazon where he's got like a thousand character sheets of the bard. Yeah. That's what I want players to sometimes have. Like, yo, I got to have another character right, ready to you go. You literally did that. You died every week and came back with a new <laughs> character for like five solid weeks straight. Yeah, but I, my deaths were impactful. And But you can you can be mean as a DM in the way that would make it so that your player players have to pay attention through environmental stuff as well because we were saying that like during my first campaign i had no combat except for when bulg's dad decided he wanted to befriend a sheep that did not want to be befriended so i had him attack that no (laughs) you're thinking you're thinking more silence of the lambs deliverance (laughs) Deliverance, there you go but but so they almost one of the characters almost died because they had to scale a mountain and they almost fell into the ocean so it was it was through more what mountains on the edge of the ocean? <laughs> it was cliffs, okay, but they had to get okay. to a cave. They had to get to a cave, and so I had them like do strength checks, do stuff. But it was an environmental hazard that almost killed the character. So your monsters aren't mean. Your world is. My mean. world is mean. Your so world. So is you can happen. have consequences without it being that's, from your monster. That's a design yeah. philosophy from. Um, I'm going to bring it back up again. Don't shoot me. Uh, Dark Souls. Uh, and, don't stop! Uh, no, um, and and Elden Ring is that the world itself will try and kill you, as will the mo- the the entire goal is to make you run out of your resources before you get to that boss chamber, and now suddenly you're having to fight. That's why the the whole eight hours rest in a in a dungeon doesn't work. I I still don't like that. I, I I think you should honestly have to leave and come back. You don't have to maybe reclear everything. There should be a little bit of like having to backtrack a little bit. Insert MMO rules here. Yeah, yeah. it should. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I really do. Like if you uh, if you go in and you clear a little bit into a dungeon, there should be a little bit of comeback. Like people, are, they're going to refill a little bit, not massively. You're not going to re. They're not repopulating overnight. Uh, but you should have to Maybe. crawl back through it a little bit because resting in a dungeon just doesn't make sense. Yeah, um, card patrols fix that though. Some, something I like to do to, to reverse that is to make the players, the dungeon keepers or the the, the bosses that have to prevent the orcs from invading. I've done that with yep. the castle invasions, or you know, which you, I, which is why I had to change the rules of who jumps off the wall to <laughs> argue. So you're, you're protecting against invaders coming in. Yeah. And, but and that's what only, would you do if they took an eight-hour rest right there and while they were, you, they were trying to invade your castle? So to argue actually towards your point, Felix, where you were saying, uh, you know, resting in a dungeon, there are ways to actually rest in a dungeon that are done. And this is why I don't like the Mordecai's mansion and spells like that. They're fun for a little bit, but I think there should only be a, a limit of what you can get in in one of those rests. If yeah. you're using Mordecai's mansion or anything like that, it should be... A, if you're using it in a dungeon because it's a door into a secular space, you should only be able to get like a short rest because you're trying to concentrate on this spell. I don't think it requires concentration, but it's it's not having any real world uh, consequences. Well, but but you always, even if you do a long rest, you have to come out the same place you went in. So even if you can get the long rest out of there, what's not to say that they don't know that you put the door there? Yeah, because I don't think the door is I don't think the door is What's to say that that Whatever you were there to get is now gone. Right, eight hours because is a eight long hours ago yeah. they, they found out you were coming to get them, and so they have had an eight hour head start on booking yep. yeah. and have just taken off and are gone. And now you have to start all over tracking them down to the next dungeon. Mm-hmm. I don't think that, See, and I, even, I don't think even at low levels you have things like um, Lehman's tiny hut, and at Lehman's tiny even hut, lower rope trick. Yeah, well, well, that's an hour, but still. But the um, the, with, I, the idea. I'm sorry, and not to catch you off real quick, but I was just also thinking when you're talking about being in that one spot when you come back, there's nothing that says that door or anything that you went through is not gone. Like so, it's there. So people know that somebody's there to you, when you walk out that door. Uh, yeah. Seventh level spell. There's one called uh, Morning Kaiden's Mansion, as opposed to Private Sanctum, um, and the Mansion spell. It's under Bard. 
um, is where you would find it. It's under wizard. It's There's a- no such thing as a bard. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I believe it's seventh level. I might be wrong. You were correct. Um, words to live by. Um, so anyhow, um, with that mansion, that mansion is literally just a little pocket dimension, and you just open up a door, and that's pretty much all it is. Yeah, but where is the door disappear? You choose where the one entry where uh, you chair sh- you choose where its one entrance is located. The entrance shimmers faintly at five mm-hmm. feet wide, ten feet tall. You and any creature designate with can, can uh, enter Entry. the extra dimensional, but it doesn't say uh, you open or close the portal within. While closed, the portal is invisible. Okay, there you go. Yep. So that's the only one that's invisible. Right, but what's to say they don't know where you cast it? Let's not to say they don't know where you disappeared at. Yeah, all of um, a sudden, the uh, the trail of bodies just stops yeah. Oh, here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The trail of blood from your bleeding barbarian just immediately stops. Or it doesn't happen. De- detect magic just is like, oh, there's mm-hmm. a there's a portal entrance right here we yeah. can see, but we can't see the portal we'll itself. Well, see, then, th- then that's a broken feet that lets you see a magical darkness. <laughs> and, I you know, see, that's... <laughs> hate you. <laughs> Uh, that's another warlock invocation that will ruin the game. So, uh, yeah. um, there's actually a great. <laughs> I hate you guys so much. In, in the talks of, of CR, um, there's a great book, a series of books by uh, Keith Ammon, Keith Amon, Keith Cora, uh, bad guy. Um, the monsters know what they're doing. Um, there's the monsters know what they're doing. More monsters know what they're doing. Live to tell the tale. Um, how to Defend Your Lair. There's a great series of books that are specifically for players and DMs to help help them through combat and scaling encounters and that kind of thing. There should like, always be there should always be consequences. See, you yeah. guys uh, were you guys were level two, I think, in one uh, one shot I ran, where a pack of what six wolves nearly killed you. Yeah, it should look. I'm saying it needs to be Goblin Slayer level stuff. Like you really should walk in and goblins are messing people up. Mm-hmm. Like you, like I get it. Sometimes you want to have a more fun campaign, but even in a fun campaign, you got to feel like you got to feel fear for your character. This is something you've created. You want them to succeed in life, and if you're not afraid of what's coming out there, you're not. That character is not going to grow. There are you're already made a perfect character that just lives in this land of happiness and sunshine. When you run into mm-hmm. a caravan of three hundred vampires <laughs> at level five. You're not supposed to attack the caravan. Mm, went, not supposed. I went to, to work one hobos. weekend. I went to work one weekend, and I come back and find out that we're in a war of vampires. So <laughs> what? What we have learned is in Luke's campaign, don't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, you can't send Baca or Felix anywhere. Hmm. All righty, I got a question for you guys. What, we talked about this uh, during lunch today. Uh, what are some fun ways you would roll for stats? I have my own method that we use as a regular thing where it's the the seven plus a d6 plus a pool of d4 four d6s to add wherever you want so that you can build your character the way you want but you're still it's still kind of kind of got the randomness that the rolling method has involved but it also gets uh like a point by in it but i have seen some fun methods out there like uh i've seen a video recently on the bingo method or you, you basically do five rows of stats, and then any any line you can make on those stats could be so they're in order. Do you get to pick your own stats on that one? Can you make like you have to have so many uh, you have to have so many below ten, and you have to like but you get to place them yourselves, or is it a pre made bingo sheet? Oh no, you literally roll for each stat. You do each five, block, so you're fi- creating five a- rows of five rows or six sorry six rows down, six rows across. And you've rolled for all these numbers. And then it's you can you can take the line down like you normally would, or you can go diagonal across the six. See, I I think that if once you 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 put all the numbers on the sheet, and the sheet's already got a, its own bingo numbers on, and then we just have an actual bingo thing where you gotta you know whenever you get bingo, that's it. There is no free space too. The free space can actually be like you 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 get to pick a stat, like you get to pick the number or something. Within a within a realm of responsibility, right. a realm of responsibility. There's no like twenty eight, or it's just a ten. You know, it's just a standard free space set. Is a, yeah, yeah, free space is ten. I like that. Yeah. That's a that's right. a pretty decent. Like that's fun. It breaks up the monotony that sometimes like it, rolling stats can be fun, but sometimes it's monotonous. Yeah. I I'm uh, I'm gonna go the other way on that. I don't think the rolling stats is um, end all be all. Um, I there are other uh, ways to be able to do it, such as just here's everybody's stats. Like you know, here's a standard array, or here's the um, whatever. Because rolling stats, I've found, has um, made 
for uneven role play, uneven not maybe not role play, but uneven combat. Um, to where you have somebody who has very little stats and they feel like they're not getting what they need out of the game, as opposed to uh, somebody who has good luck, rolls well, or by any luck of the imagination, maybe those numbers aren't exactly what they rolled and now their character sheet has different numbers on it. You calling me uh, out? No, no. We're actually no. calling Bolg out. No, mm-hmm. no, I would never call anybody out. No, it's Bolg's dad. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's Nickel, Nickel Wart. <laughs> but. Um, the, sometimes the numbers aren't, you know, they, they make a huge uh, huge difference in what your role play is and what you uh, what you encounter and how your character develops. Because yeah. even when you roll stats, you may have, like, for example, there was a campaign that we're going to start today, and uh, my stats are 14, 9, 15, 15, 12, and 14. There's not a number of plus three anywhere in there. No, the highest actually... stat I have is plus two. Yeah, that's actually yeah. a pretty good average. Which is, is only got most one stat below nine. Yeah, below ten. Below ten. Yeah, yeah. Too, so, I have, so I have one negative one. But this is the most average character I've ever rolled. Like to the point of, sure, I have plus ones and plus twos here. But now we're gonna have other people who have, when they rolled, like in our current campaign with uh, you with Luke here, uh, <laughs> we have somebody who has eight, uh, who has four eighteens and two twelves. But see, because he had better luck. I, I, and that's where I like the standard array, but I also want players to have a little bit of fun with that because part of character creation is the fun. We have created some great characters together. We used to go to breakfast all the time and like theory craft new characters of what we're going to do. We've had actually some of the best combos out there yep. of great characters. Like but, our first character we ever played. Oh, yeah. Well, you walk into a game store and start throwing halflings places. Yeah. That's how you get a best friend, people. That's you just you go in there, find me. the smallest guy, and you chuck him. And that that is why I, I came up with my kind of hybrid I think because I like the the against type where you have a a strong wizard, you know. <laughs> that is, I work out. <laughs> it just happened to be that you this guy is genetically predisposed to having been muscular, but what he likes and what he studies is magic. I use muscular yeah. magic. Yeah, so so <laughs> it, it, it's a suboptimal. You know, you're not always built because. I'm Louis There's so Armstrong. much of the, the min maxing that goes on. <laughs> it, is, it, that, that I want to hold takes you real... away from what could be good role play. <laughs> yeah. right. I want to hold you right there. I can just imagine like this, like flex mentalo, this Louise Armstrong. You're just out there, and instead of uh, you got it's the verbal, somatic, and uh, what's the other the other type of cast material, material. material but yeah. his uh, his uh, somatic thing is just he's like, flex. Yeah. and now goes <laughs> the <laughs> fireball. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I cast punch. Yeah, and and you can you can talk to your your DM. Sometimes they'll let you uh, alter. Okay, this is my stat that I ended up with, and this is how I'm going to make it make sense. And they may go, sure, you can roll that versus what you would normally roll for that. Can I have thing. a strength based so, wizard? Right. Like, just let me do that whole flexing thing because if, if you could hilarious. talk your yeah, if you could talk That's your DM into it, class. dude. <laughs> it's a strength based yeah, my, the, the Felix the, the character I based my name off of for this uh, rolled a, like I had a, I had a four in charisma that's how I ended up with this voice um, <laughs> so it was, charismatic it was uh, it was all because rolling for stats has the good sides and the bad sides yeah he was a very smart individual he just couldn't talk to anybody without wanting to be punched in the face. But what do you mean the I'm bad stupid? side sometimes helps so much for the role playing. Oh, that's exactly yeah. what I mean. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, that's bulk. why I took the names you... and, and went with it. Yeah, but that's but bulk. then just <laughs> But then you have those uh characters that are like that those players that are there for combat too because you know, we have a mixture of those in their campaign that some mm-hmm. that are just well, suck and, at role play. And yep. and that's the thing with with the D&D system in 5e, most classes you will really only need one decent stat. Doesn't even have to be that great of a stat. You just need that one Yeah. Yeah. Whatever is your primary for your class, mm-hmm. as long as you have it that above that where you're not getting a minus to it, you're going to be okay with the combat. Yeah, because like the, for Loke's current campaign, mm-hmm. I have two negatives and one zero modifier. Are you and the then healer? Ha- uh, yes. She is. So yes. she can kill somebody with healing spells. I love it. <laughs> but yeah. now her... her her but wisdom is high enough. My wisdom is really high. Yeah, oh, that's she lame. has a high wisdom, high con. That's I don't want to. I don't want to hear any more about this. I don't yeah. want to hear. Of but like, but it, you can still play characters that are effective. But and then just use your negatives as well. Like, you know, look at Bulk as something that you build your character. Yeah. <laughs> you you would character. you wouldn't want to build a warlock or a paladin with the four charisma. That uh, no. <laughs> yeah. uh. 
I mean, you unless they're a straight, you wouldn't want to. But no, it could Hexblade, be fun. Uh, well, no, because Hexblade still requires charisma. But, but think about yeah. that, though. He's like he he comes out there, and the wizard's like he just rips his shirt off, and he's like ice wall. And well, hey, just, well, you could turn it into a character who is really bad at what they're supposed to be doing, and that could be fun for the story. Yeah. Like they always just need we healing, him and they're as terrible at doing their job. <laughs> It, so you you can pl- you can have fun with yeah. it. We have a current character who does that, mm-hmm. but it's not because of his stats. It's not because of the way we rolled them. It's because of well, he's just terrible luck, or <laughs> just doesn't do things he's well. He it, wants, yeah, he, wants, he doesn't succeed at things he wants to do. We we have a running joke that I have to sage my box, my rolling box with all my dice before we play any of the games because I roll like Will Wheaton. I am terrible. Why did you have to specifically say your rolling box? Because box could be titular. <laughs> she had to because sage my her sage. box. I have to sage my box. <laughs> but, you know, so it, it turned into this thing, but like I could have the most amazing stats in the world, but my rolling is terrible. I yeah. will Wheaton a lot. <laughs> ah. Yeah, stats don't make the game. It's called a yeah. role-playing game for a reason. So, but but in if, my if you use the, the standard, if everybody uses the standard array, you wind up, your high stat is going to be in whatever your primary stat you need for your I beg class. to differ. I beg to differ. We just talked about where it's fun to play characters that are bad at that. <laughs> so if you're using the standard array, you're most likely going to have that one guy that's like, you know what? I'm going to be the strength-based wizard. So, it takes a special person to do that, yeah, and, and with, they're sitting right across from me. With standard array, uh, you don't so see that Most very often. people would not do that. So yeah. You don't so, see that very often. With, now, with rolling, it happens. Yeah. Well, and the the game that we're going to be starting this afternoon, the our friend who who is DMing it, she refuses to let anybody have poor stats. If you come to her and go, "Yeah, this is what I rolled," she'll re-roll it. She will not let you have low. She like she has a certain one that she doesn't want to see below a nine or whatever it uh, is. I'm the same way. That's, I, that's, but I'm going to abuse you. That's the difference. No, like, see, I think that's I think that's unfair to the player and the DM. One, you're you're trying to tell a player that you know you're. You're you're okay at everything, you know. Instead of going, okay, it, so you suck at telling lies, but it's or a, you it's suck a different, at you know figuring out that the stove is hot. If a different campaign style in her campaigns, everybody is not superheroes, but basically yeah, we're superheroes. About, we're about to, world, yeah, we're about in to her go to world. A test. Are you are you? But does she have an upward limit too? That's the question. Like, because if you're gonna like keep a lower limit, you might as well keep an upper limit because you don't want people to be godlike. Because when you well, get she those does 80, want them to be good li- godlike. Because the entire world is is it's like My Hero Academia. Everybody can do something. Right. Um, so whatever that is. So all those. Some yeah, but of there's them, only one All Might. Let's just go with that. Let's yeah, stop that right there. There was. Uh, there's only <laughs> one all might. Anyway, the idea behind that is is that if you're going to limit the lower stats, you might as well limit the upper ones because you that's a, an 18. Well, they are is a huge by the book power gap. Yeah, yeah. and you're 20. and you're limited by the rolls. Yeah, by by rules 20, and then if you really want to push it, you can get an ion stone to get to 22. 18, or, or but if anyway, you're a barbarian the, 24. The modifiers from 26. an 18 to 20 plus are ridiculous 28. at a low level. So a plus I, three and plus four are massive. Yeah. But then, with a, if you use your ASIs to boost your stats every, but then you so won't be able levels. to see through magical darkness. You won't be able to see. <laughs> <laughs> but you you wind up with that twenty stat eventually. But yeah, so I think she lim- I think she limits it at nine, which still get- can give you a negative one, yeah. or she if or at the very least it's ten, and yeah. then you're at a zero, and you yeah. are at the mercy yeah. of the dice. Because I have a negative one in that method that I say I use. The lowest you can get is an eight. Mm-hmm. Yep, because y- it's. Seven plus one d six in order. But you did that on purpose because because uh, people, the last time we had somebody, because everybody uses intelligence as a dump stat. <laughs> we had an entire and an, an entire of party of idiots. I don't know what you mean. I mean, which party. which could but be fine was a great guy. every once in a while, it, but if if that's not going to make sense to what you're if, running, it's good if you have one or two individuals in the party who are dumb. <laughs> it's bad when you have eight individuals in a party of eight. <laughs> Who are dumb. Well, you only need one smart person, but they have to be able to make decisions. And yeah. I think that that's the biggest well, deal. So, and I, but here's the thing. So if you look at it, I got it up here on the screen on this uh, tetracube.com. It's a D&D stat block generator. So you're st- uh, starting at, uh, at seven is when you get a minus two, eight, uh, or sorry, starting at six is a minus two, eight minus one, 10 is plus zero, 12 is plus one, 14 plus two, 16 plus three, 18 plus four, 20 plus five. Plus four and plus five 
on a level one is massive. That means you are probably, let's say we use intelligence not as the dump stat. You're probably the smartest guy when you walk into a room, all right? You're just the guy that goes in. I am the smartest guy when I walk into a room. That's why it's it's an empty cell. (laughs) In old school D&Ds, your IQ was 10 times your intelligence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now, so think about that, though. Now you have... I, uh, when you limit it to these lower numbers, but you're not limiting it to the top, you're just saying everybody's okay. Yeah. And I, and I get the idea of wanting behind that, but then these players, like I said, you're you're actually but cursing the players. You're also got to think though, like animal level intelligence is about a six. Yeah, but I'm not playing with a bunch of animals. Exactly. But you could be. You could. But be. by dice, somebody who rolls three ones. Oh, yeah. Uh, could I have was a ab- three intelligence. I was about to say, I could have a plus so five and continue here's, to roll. Oh, three here's my ar- so here's my argument against that. Yeah. People get wrapped up around the idea that if your intelligence is a negative, you're a dumbass. That is no. not true. You Nowhere does it say in the book that if you're, if you're intelligence, now in old editions, yes, it was right. a multiplicat- multiplicative of your IQ, it is not anymore. Now it's right. a, it has nothing to do. It's how you role play that character. You can be an eighteen, but, have an eighteen intelligence, and be a dumbass. Yes, but from a three to a six Hi. by the book is <laughs> animal intelligence. That, that is not human intelligence. That you are so d- that yeah. dumb. You could yeah, also be a sheltered person with that type of intelligence, where you've been like you've lived in a town your whole life, and you don't know anything other than what the townspeople taught you. Th- that and is maybe like there's not a smart person in the mental, town to be able to teach you mental math handicap to the point where you can only feed yourself. You probably don't clean yourself. Like somebody has so to take care of you at that level the, of intelligence. What you're doing though, when you do this, is you're not actually giving uh, the players a chance to be bad at something. Yeah. They need to be. If you you can't. Everybody in here. here. Loke, are you good at World of Warcraft? Uh, sure. Like, no. no, you're not. Bulg, are you good at World of Warcraft? Eh. All right. Rabba, are you good at World of Warcraft? Yeah. All right, sure you are. <sighs> Felix, you good at World of Warcraft? I'm better than most in this room. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Not everybody's good at something, but somebody is there. So if you base a stat block based off that, just it was something that I knew one person was good at in the room. If you base that stat block off that, now you're I don't you, you give yourself not enough credit. Anyway, besides the point. The idea is, is not everybody's good at something. All right, I'm in the military. I'm probably uh, outside this broken ankle that I've got right now. I'm probably more physically fit than most of you guys. Could I probably beat you in a strength and endurance contest? Yes, I, I can. But fit. if it comes when it comes to, when it comes to Phoenix when it comes to fixing computers and stuff, you know who the first person I call is? I call Felix because I know he's a lot better at computers. He was asking me today about what a, what a good character is. You're not going to be good at everything. So when you limit these characters with these player stats like this, you're not you're not doing the player themselves a handy. You're hurting actually the role play value of it. Yeah, the combat is going to be a little bit more even. It may help with the scaling of the creatures that we talked about earlier, but your players themselves are going to be losing out. When it comes to role play. So anyway, th- fun ways to roll your stats. Yeah, fun <laughs> ways to roll your stats. I know that's how this conversation started, but that's it. We but didn't even. Still, there still has to be like, if the guy is so weak, he can't wear equipment. But nothing says it. Just says that you are not as good as somebody right. else that but does that. It, it doesn't. That it strength says that ten is the standard, the average. It's common. Yeah. But it yeah. doesn't. So but that just a, means you're less good. That means you can't pick up the 20, 20 pound barbell as many car- times what's as. What's the carry capacity of somebody with a three strength? Not a lot. Mm. A feather. It's not a lot. It's you um, can't even wear clothes <laughs> and still move with a three strength. There is no reason to ever let a character have a three strength. Well, Your I, strength score multiplied by 15. So a three mm-hmm. times 15 45 is pounds. 45 pounds. 45 pound carry capacity. All right, that's uh, about a rucksack's worth. Uh, anybody, like, that's still. Well, that, that, that's got to include your shoes. That your is that is pants, less than what shirt. I am required to be able to carry there, at my job. Yeah. But then you have, but the, okay, but here's the thing. Then how do you have a fairy that's got 20 strength? We've had characters that yeah. we've had players that have played pixies and fairies. Ants. I want to be. What do I want to be? Oh, I'm going to be a barbarian fairy. There's Mighty no mouse. way in yeah, hell. Yeah. Well, ants, ants exist. Ants the same thing. Yeah. Mighty ants, mouse. Yeah. Okay, but ants we're talking exist. about fairies. Yes, and I know, but they can carry way more than their own body weight. Right, yep. I get that, but there are they going to be able to magic? <laughs> also, magic exists. I is, guess that magic exists, but is, now, like I said, but now. It doesn't make sense. You're 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 telling me that this fairy is going to be if I, if I have Bolg, this massive orc that is uh, got a twenty strength, and I've got a pixie that's also got a twenty strength. Are they going to be able to lift the same things? She flexed. 
Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, well, this is literally, see now, you're, now you're going rules as written, uh, rules as implied. So. Rules. Well, th- well, this is actually, because there's no rule that says that you're 20 strength, yeah. and that's the argument but, I'm trying to make. But there that, is a rule that says that if you get to zero, you die. Now, here's the thing. Uh, why, How is does that a zero? Zero, why is a zero charisma kill you? Do I look so ugly I looked in the mirror and killed myself? Yes. What is a zero charisma What's have to do with yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. So, what is a zero? You are I, I so unlikable this. that your soul hates your body. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, because I can understand not being strong enough to be able to lift my own, to open my lungs. Like strength zero, that's fine. Or, you know, I can't hold my own body weight, I'm going to die. Dexterity, I still, you know, I can't move, but, you know, my mother-in-law has MS. She can't move either, and she's still alive. So how is dexterity, yeah. dex, dexterity zero? actually going to kill you why does zero kill you if you look at the way the stats are built so i agree with you in certain aspects that high stats and low stats have to deal with the variations of the characters themselves it just tells you that you're probably not as good as somebody else and so i think when you limit when you say oh well you you're you can all be at least something it's i'm not i don't want to equate it to a participation trophy but i want you guys to be varied i want everybody to be i I think it's just the the where that where that line is i think is where we're disagreeing because i i think they have to have a basic capacity to be a player yeah um so uh, as, as to go back to your difference between Bolg and a fairy. Um, well, my strength me, 30 to begin with. Right. Well, <laughs> even if you had a 20 and you had a pixie who was 20, rules as written, a tiny creature can only carry half of whatever a normal creature could. So they have half a carrying capacity. So a tiny creature but fairy they, that... But so their, their strength their car- is still the same. Right. But yeah. their carrying capacity is less, meaning that they don't do 15 times. They do seven and a half times. As opposed to somebody in Bolg's case, where he, I think, at some point turned I'm an orc. But well, no, I'm an, I'm an orc, so I count as double. Uh, I count as large. As anyway. a large, which is two times your which weight. Which is third. Okay, ability, so right? but when you make the same attack, you both use a maul. It's the same damage. Actually, think about that. Small creatures can't use a maul because they don't have. Yeah, they can't carry the. Yeah, same. they 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 actually can't do it because it's a large weapon or a two-handed heavy weapon and. Okay. What? Okay. So if, if they use, use a, a long sword, sword or, or a short sword, sword yes. they would do the same damage. That's the idea yes. behind it. All right. You yes. you got me on that one. As the rules the is written. Rules as written. They do have things that are against there, it, but they do but have you, things that are So you're for telling your me that Pixie, well. who is a tiny creature, is going to do the same damage as uh, Bolg, who is a uh, who is a giant orc. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah. they're wielding it two hand and putting all of their force behind it. A short sword. I'm not wielding two hand. I'm just gonna. You ever see uh. the TikTok videos of the of where they like have uh they have the little dwarf guy doing something and they runs into the water <laughs> and they spray him with water it's, and it's like a cap of water. That's the difference between having you as a massive guy come running through a door versus that pixie come flying through it like a little bullet hole through the door. Yeah. Yeah, well, bullets can sometimes do more damage. Oh, yeah. uh, on the other side. So that's all I'm saying is like so these rolling stats. stats. Yeah, rolling yeah, stats, man. Rolling stats. Yeah. Smash Brothers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love how this guy didn't, didn't even get to that one yet. Yeah. 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 This, yeah so I saw I saw a really so complete. Just let's let's get back mm. on topic. So I saw a fun video where they took the same character in Smash Brothers. They named them the stats. So there was one character named Strength one, and then they let them fight it out. Until they created what their stats would the be. AIs? They yeah, the, the AIs. AIs. Yeah. The AIs. Yeah. 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 Dude, so they have had, you ever done that for dinner? It's delicious. Yeah, so they would have 14, 17. It was how many kills they, they accumulated. So what what'd you do? Set the limit to 20? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The kill limit to 20? Yes. And then you what? went out for dinner and came back. Yeah, they were still fighting yeah, because it's going to take 10 hours for that it didn't fight really to end. seem to take that you long. Put them, okay. You put them on level 10s and yeah, yeah. It, it goes by quick. Yeah. 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 You but put yeah, on max just, level. It, yeah, you just watch them quick. fight it out, See, and at the end, it has your stat block. <laughs> I think it's. I think a better way, because my argument there in that with lunch is, you, st- t- statistically, you're more likely to have somebody that's got plus twenty kills, which the book caps at twenty. Uh, I think you put the standard array in there, and I think that works better. And then the kill order is your stat order. So if you get uh, the 10 is the first one, that's your strength. If you get the, the 13, that's your dex, and so on and so that's forth. That's an interesting throw on it. See, they did have a uh, a contingency for that, though. If they went over 20, if they had more than 20 kills, that point, over 20, moved into a like a free zone. Like a pool. Yeah, like See, a pool. I would actually take that and make it go negative. So I would get you get to twenty and then past twenty, you would then get down to nineteen, eighteen for every kill that they've gotten over twenty. So I, that it actually drops your stats down. Because there's not a really having a bad stat doesn't change it too much. 
Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I think the whole point is that there's a lot of different creative ways that you could create. You don't have to roll the standard yeah, yeah. stats. The, you could do you, whatever you there's want. There's the blackjack method. A, yeah, if you've got a great way, let us know. You can always email us at Bulg and yeah, PC. The, the blackjack method, you play, uh, you play six rounds of blackjack. You try and get as close to 18 as you can without going over. If you go over, um, you go you reset back down to 10 minus the amount you went over. That's, Wow. Yeah, that's, that yeah, sounds that, like a lot of work. I feel like that. Yeah, that hurts. Because I can't, e- I can't even but beat the house at that point. That's you, the whole you point. You want to start a, start a fight with your friends? <laughs> yeah, we go out there and just no, you know, put make a them, number on make everybody. Them put their real, yeah, put real numbers to their own stats. So, like I said, how much you could bench press uh, would be your. Yeah, that was the way. Yeah, um, we when my dad when you uh, start first ran for myself, uh, Bacaw my best friend and his best friend, he uh, made us fill out sheets with, you know, what we thought of our original stats. He gathered them up, averaged them, and then handed them back out, and then that's how we played. So everybody at the table asked or thought what your strength was. Mm-hmm. They wrote it down on a piece of paper. They had the six different pieces of paper down, or four in your case, and uh, then the DM averaged them all out? Yeah. All right, yeah. so it wasn't just what do I think my own strength is. Everybody else at the table assumed what your strength was. Yeah, so like my You're best friend was the the strong one because he was a big boy, and then uh, uh, Bacaw's best friend was uh, well, we we uh, we made him the bitch boy, made him a cleric. Um, <laughs> so he had a, a higher wisdom. Um, uh, Bacaw was more dexterous than us, um, and then I was the intelligence guy because that was the only claim to fame I had. So. <laughs> All right. That's what but we yeah, did. But it, it, in my experience, when you do that, it tends to start fights you, because you have to like the people you play with, and yeah. you have to know them. I think in our group, <laughs> Nigglewort would just get I, eights across yeah, the board. I, well, and, I, I think, and he I would think be pissed our, about it yeah. because he he would think he has a twenty intelligence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, that's what I was going to say. I think know. in our group, there is maybe one or two people that would argue with it. But we already know that certain people do certain things. Uh, we have a friend of ours who goes to the gym every day. His strength would be roughly a 16, 18, somewhere around there. Yeah, you know, even in, in, in the stats of D&D. Not currently, because, you know, he can't lift a building. But <laughs> it would be 16, 18. Yeah, because uh, even when he plays a spellcaster, yeah. he ends up as a fighter I, type. I, I think that's the issue with that one, is, like, you're basing it too much off of what you believe in people versus, like, what well, is the, actually... That one's... Uh, the one that um, they're describing is actually quantifiable. You go to the gym. You do all the machines. You get the averages from those and get your... Uh, you know your strength but numbers. Some of them aren't. St- how do you how do you quantify the wisdom? How do you quantify the charisma? I think we just uh, oh see charisma. I think we have a very good a uh, good example in Baca because uh, no, he's wonderful at talking to people. He can bullshit his way through any situation. He's also very good looking. The only problem is that every once in a while he has an you know uh, like an anger issue or something like that, which would drop his charisma down some a little bit. From where he would be at, like everything I described would be like a twenty, well, and then because he has that one problem, you'd have to drop it down to like wisdom, eighteen or seventeen. My opinion. Wisdom, uh, wisdom would be tangential to intelligence, but not uh, quite no. the same. I don't I was, know. I was, I was, I was, was going to say, was was say, like philosophy would be something more like asking philosophical no, no, questions no. and coming up with that. I was kind just of about to say that when I describe my husband to people, I say that Bolg is the smartest dumb per- or the dumbest smart person I've ever met. He mm-hmm. has great intelligence, terrible wisdom. Common so sense. I yeah. would yeah, it's common, common sense. sense. Yeah. I I feel personally myself I have but, a little more common sense than other people, but I'm not very intelligent in certain things. Street yeah. smarts versus book smarts. But, exactly. but rating that versus the group, yeah, if you're doing like a standard array, that's one way to do it. When you come in and say, "Okay, you know, the smartest person in our group is a 20." Probably not. No, no, no. A twenty is going to be a super genius, uh, right. you know, but double you, double the normal you average the intelligence. Do. You don't know the things I know. I know the things you know. Yeah, yeah that's dangerous. <laughs> but so I mean, so when you get into those those harder to quantify well, ones, it's may- going to start fights. Maybe take that idea and go a little bit further with it. Take these numbers and then write them at the top of the page, like you know, like you said, take the standard array, put the standard array at the top of the page, and then have them put where they think those numbers belong on that person. And then you average it out that way. So here's the six numbers we're going to use. Here's the six stats you think about that person, and then go ahead and do it that way. Or I think you that's, that's, really that's basically idea. what we did. Yeah. 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 Or you I can make it a, a completely uh, blind grab. Everybody rolls, and then you put it in a pool, and you all have to pull from that blind 
like list of, of things. So like I rolled a 16, a 12, a three, we put them on pieces of paper. We put it in a hat. All right. Now we're grabbing strength. Okay. That way, this is a way that you grab whatever your thing. I mean, are. that's, that's yeah. basically the same thing as rolling for your stats by using a D 20. I've seen that before too. Well, yeah, well but it's, it's making it fun in a, like, it's like a game of, Oh, I got this. It's like if you have someone like uh, myself or one of the other guys we play with who constantly roll good stats, it's, he doesn't constantly roll good stats. They just happen to land on the pl- on the way he puts them down. Okay, oh. so for people who need to sage their box, yeah. <laughs> that gives it that, the that, rolling box. Yeah. The rolling box. I am sage, um, <laughs> but um, that gives you the opportunity to you know not be great at rolling, but pull somebody else's stats that is good at rolling. And now that person who didn't get the good stats ha- uh, gets the chance to you know play a character that's not as OP as usual. Yeah. It's still relying on luck. Luck is like eye color. It kind or, of yeah. follows. Yeah, or you play. Like, it follows the same trend. I was born on a Friday the 13th, but if I didn't yeah. have bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Exactly. Uh. <laughs> just oh. find a way to ha- make fun with it. Just like make it a game. Yeah. yeah. All righty, guys. So, so you want to make a game for your game? I want to make a game for my game. Okay. Well, okay. that's that's your. your um, it's mini games. Your <laughs> session games. zero. Your mini session games. zero is a mini, mini game yeah. since you're like. Most of session zero is like talking about what's going to happen and all that other stuff. Well, here's a little game. We're not actually playing the game, but here's a game that we could play. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to like annoy people. Yeah. All righty, guys. That's been. Uh, I know we didn't get into the one topic I wanted to. <laughs> can you polymorph a druid? Uh, but we're going to have to. The answer is yes. Yeah. No, you can't. I can <laughs> no, tell you why you can't polymorph a druid. Next time. Because um, a druid can wild shape out of anything. But that's that'll be no, an argument for next they, time. Okay, no, I have I have I have something about this because I've been thinking about it all day since you brought it up. Um polymorphing a druid, they have the same intelligence as whatever that creature is, and so they don't know what that what their intelligence is. A chair. Well, I have a chair. I can still into a chair. the wild shape, they are physically changing the cells of their body to another animal. The but least. they keep by rules as written, they keep their wisdom, intelligence, and charisma. A polymorph, they assume the wisdom, charisma, and intelligence. Yeah, but yes, does a cha- what's the chair's intelligence? Well, I mean you can't polymorph Zero. anything into so, a chair anyhow. So then it would kill you. Yes. Yeah, but you can't so change poly- anything into a chair, can you? You can't with polymorph, no. no. But if you polymorph them into a uh, an alligator or a chicken, mm-hmm. that's animal intelligence. Animal intelligence, they're not going to be wise enough to know that they can change into a person they again. They can change into a person. To know how to cast goes back to that stat thing. You're, sh- you're assuming that stats mean your actual intelligence. No. That's the old way of thinking of it. But you're, you're the not actual as good. creature. So yeah. a chicken You, you can't, are a chicken. You are in not, mind yeah. and body. Yeah. You look up at the sky and open your mouth when it That's rains a and you drown yourself. That's a turkey. Tomato potato. Yeah. No, it's, it's two different animals. In, you know, polymorph them into a turkey. Then. The trans- yes. uh, it's, uh, t- transforms... Uh, the spell transforms a creature that you can see within range to a new form. An unwilling creature must make a wisdom saving throw to avoid the effect. A shape changer automatically succeeds on the saving throw. A druids are shape changers. Can't polymorph druid. Haha, changeling, same way. Can't polymorph changeling a changeling. I agree with. I don't believe that druids, druids are, are shape changers. Druids are shape changers because they have wild shape. That is my only argument against it right there. That's the only argument I need. See, I think when a druid gets to the point that they can alter self, I think that would be the point to which they couldn't be polymorphed. Because they can alter self yeah, at will. Yeah, they don't have any wild think, shapes left. Yeah, because what happens if they can't wild shape anymore? Isn't there an evocation that allows you to cha- like alter? No, I don't think it's alter self, but I think there's uh, disguise self. No, that alter be- self actually changes your body. Disguise self is an illusion. Okay, so, so all right, alter so, self and druids at seventh level yeah, like, can alter self. I like, think it's seventh level. Uh, it yeah, like, there is a certain level where they can do it at will. Changelings <laughs> yeah. can't be. You're a changeling changelings druid. Can't, I'm a changeling druid. What about? Changeling can't cannot be polymorphed. Be polymorphed. <laughs> Changelings can't be polymorphed Absolutely. by the rules as written. Oh, then that would also, what about shifters? Shifters, yeah. shifters can change their body, too. Shifters but can they can be. only change it once every I long rest. Now, me unless can, they, be you. can they do it if they are willingly uh, accepting to the polymorph? I am always me oh, unless I want to be you. Automatically succeed. Oh, okay, so they're physically <laughs> unable. Yeah. It's not meant Druid circle feature, which uh, Druid circle feature, ability score improve, it can't versatility, a timeless body, B spells. Uh, are you sure that's not like a, a feature of either the arch? Maybe it's a feature of the arch druid. No, I believe it's yeah, timeless it's body. It's timeless body. Oh, no, no, no. Keep going up. Sorry. That was, that's not it. It's not timeless body. Uh, yeah, because that means they can't age. Yeah. So you got wild. Uh, it sh- might be a um a bear tr- or a um, of a, c- like, a circle like a feature. Guy. Yeah. So um, that's what I, that's what I'm saying. You can't wild wild shape, wild shape just as it is. Starting at second level, you can use your action to magically assume the shape of a beast that you have seen before. So that automatically like that says that you can change shapes. Uh, it's you can use your action. 
You can use this feature shoots. twice. You regain uh, expended uses when you finish short or longer. This you do it all of the terms of the beast. You can transform, turn as beast, second level. There, uh, you can stay in beast shape form for a number of hours. You go to half your druid level, and then revert to your normal form unless you expend another use of this feature. You can revert to your normal form earlier by using a bonus action. You automatically revert to it if you fall unconscious uh, each or okay. drop zero. Okay, so uh, maybe. Maybe if they have wild shapes left, as soon as they hit zero, yeah, no, be like I, I, I'll, I'll even take that one. Like if you have no wild shapes left, uh, you can't, you can be polymorph. But if you can wild shape, and this is my argument when we were at lunch today, is that yeah, if you, uh, you have to burn wild shape, but you can't be polymorphed. It's an automatically, an automatic succession of polymorph. Druids can cast polymorph on themselves as a fourth level spell. Does that mean that they're as smart as they should be? To know that they can get out That's of that. So that makes that argument question right there is like if you're if you're as dumb as a chicken, are you going to figure out how to how to unpolymorph yourself? No, but you wouldn't typically polymorph yourself. If how you're long a is poly, how how long does polymorph? Yeah, well, yeah, you're smarter than the chicken. You're, yeah, you're, I'm smarter than the chicken before the chi- I turn into it. Yeah, you're dumber than the chicken because you turned yourself into a chicken. Exactly. But, so uh, how one long hour is, concentration? Yeah. So you would on it? Would you, you'd lose concentration because you can't concentrate? How concentration? I mean, if, I, if I step on a pebble, maybe. But your concentration rules, I think, isn't there something to do with intelligence or wisdom on your concentration? Yeah. you got to make a concentration save. It's constitution. O- only when, yeah, it's a constitution when check, you take and damage. it's only based okay. off if you take damage. So, yeah, somebody would have to go up and kick you. Yes. <laughs> and now you're Zelda. Uh, <laughs> Chicken. Oh, uh, See, that's, and that's my argument. I, I don't think you can polymorph a druid. And I, I've made really good arguments, and no one's everybody's like, oh, well, you know, rules. I was like, no, d- tell me why. Because you change shapes. That's the whole idea of wild shape, especially is when you wild shape it. Uh, about true polymorph or what are the higher level polymorphs? Does it uh, still have that? What's uh, what's the wording on true polymorph? Uh, same thing. It's polymorph just for uh, you can change in any creature. But does it still beast. have the... Uh, but not any, any object? Any, the sa- the shapeshifters automatically save. Uh, oh, I don't know about that. Uh, mm-hmm. Language. So technically, by reading that, Going back to that, changelings actually can't ever be polymorphed because nope. it says they automatically succeed. Not mm-hmm. that they can choose not to succeed, succeed, which is a uh, which is another wording that they use in other areas. Ah. Yep. So, the rules is written. So, so anyway. you could never make you could never polymorph yourself. So I will always be me unless I want to be you. Does that mean she can't be a druid though? Because then if she can't change the wild shape. No, but she can change herself. Back. Yeah, wild shape. Yeah, even say the that. ninth level yeah, spell, shape changers aren't affected by this spell. Bam! Mm-hmm. Druids can't be polymorphed. So anyway, fun ways to roll your stats. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, oh, yeah. I get it. With that being said, it's time for us to get out of here. I want to thank Felix and Drava for coming in today. This has been a great episode. Thanks think- for having me. Yeah. I appreciate it, guys. Oh, you can always find us at Chef Bolg and Pirate Captain on the Facebook page. Check out our YouTube. Share this with your friends. Give it a liking, thumb up, subscribe, all that fancy stuff that they want you to do. And as always, say goodbye, Luke. Goodbye. And say goodbye, Bolg. (coughs) Bye. Really? That's the way you wanted to go out? Gross. I'm sorry. We appreciate you listening to Chef Bolg and the Pirate Captain's Recipes for Everything. Featuring Luke the Bard, of course. Make sure you go find us on Facebook to see what old concoctions Bolg is cooking up in the kitchen. And if you want your emails read, then email us at bolgandpc at gmail.com. And as always, happy adventures. Yarrr.